pen made by Tia with our rod. Recently, there's been a lot of discussion about YouTube and some problems that are going on with their algorithms and how subscribers are being put in touch with the content creators on YouTube as a platform. Some people are claiming that they're being unsubscribed from people's channels by the cold, calculating hands of computers. And uh, by and large, lots of people are saying they're having trouble seeing when the people that they love to follow are putting out new videos. Content creators are feeling this and a drop in their total views, which limits their revenue. And that's something to be concerned about. And we here at Pen Made Mightier don't really have a dog in that fight yet. So we kind of have a uh, interesting perspective. As people who don't currently make money off of what we do here, we're doing this purely for the love. And at our low subscriber count, we haven't felt the cold calculating hands of the machine grip us too tightly. However, there appears to be a very simple way to fix this, at least from the outside looking in. That's what I want to talk about today. As a brief history, Google has used lots of metrics in their YouTube uh, algorithms to try and determine which videos are successful and should be promoted over the years. All of them have had flaws though, and they've all had ways that people could take advantage of them to push their shit up to the top and have done so with well, ease, actually. Which is why uh, Google has to continuously make new algorithms and find new ways to promote better videos and try and make it a more even playing field. Uh, the first one they did, of course, was pretty simple. It was just on views. You know, if you got a lot of views and there's lots of likes, and that's good. Whatever. Problem there was people started making only feel good content to get them maximum five stars and then eventually to max out their like bar instead of their dislikes, um, just so that they could constantly have that maxed out. They also made content that was really short and uh, made sure that people would get lots of views that way. And of course, the clickbait thumbnails that people have come to love and hate over the years. This meant that there was lots of content that people would click on. It would be short, so they'd get lots of views as they went through their channel clicking every 30 second video. And those likes and all that stuff added up to channels making 10 second videos with provocative thumbnails, usually full of boobs, would make tons of revenue that way. And that's uh, obviously not what YouTube wanted to be. After that, they tried watch time. A watch time can be pretty good because it shows that people watched a lot of a video for a long amount of time. The problems came on their end though. See, long videos don't necessarily have lots of ads and ads is what YouTube is gonna sell itself on. They don't have the ads, they're not actually making the revenue and thus that metric becomes a little less important to them. This also put a real hamper on what kind of content could be coming to YouTube to be successful. Animations, which had previously gotten tons of views and thus tons of acclaim, fell by the wayside because it's almost impossible to make a weekly hour-long animation, whereas a 10-minute vlog takes 10 minutes to film, maybe an hour to edit, then you're done. That sort of content rose to the top and left animations, which people had come to YouTube for originally. The first several videos I watched on YouTube were all animations that I loved, watched over and over again. They probably got tons of money off me because of it. But that sort of stuff diminished and was replaced with the vanilla machine press, easy to make content of daily vlogs where people talked about what they did in the day, unboxed some new product, showed off their shopping haul, or just chatted with a friend. And again, it's not necessarily that any of this content is bad. It's just that it means certain content has an inherent advantage and it hampers creativity as a whole. This also led to a lot of copyright problems where people would just put up movies or make their uh, videos arbitrarily long, post entire albums or post songs that were several hours long because, hey, <laughs> that's watch minutes, right? So yeah, yeah, it led to that and YouTube had to fix itself again. Next was viewing sessions. Now I think viewing sessions, were, uh, that's a pretty good idea. Viewing sessions work like this. You watched a video and at the end, there's links to more videos. If you click those videos, you continue on to the next video. YouTube sees you've created a positive viewing session and rewards you accordingly. Problems there? Well, there's always an end to a YouTube chain. You run out of time, you run out of energy. And some videos that are really long, obviously we don't leave a lot of room for good viewing sessions. 
This led to the rise again of 10 second videos that left you looking for the next video so that you could get a better viewing session because it encouraged you to look for a new video by being not what you looked for videos that pretended to be what you're looking for, like how to basic, only not funny and amazing, uh, that put themselves to the top of your search queue by manipulating tags and search algorithms so that you clicked on it, watched five seconds of nothing, created a good viewing session when you went on to look for what you were actually looking for. So again, easily manipulated, easily broken, not a perfect fix. As far as I know, viewing sessions didn't last for that long. Actually, it's part of the problem is that as far as I know, but I'll get to that in a minute. Now, some people have said that there's also the percentage quota, which is how many subscribers you have, let's say 100, just because it's an easy number, versus how many watch the entire video, let's say 50, because that's an even number, means that only 50% of your subscribers watched your video all the way to the end. And thus, they can stop promoting your content because well, only 50% of your die-hard subscribed fans actually found that video worthwhile. This really starts to hamper channels like PewDiePie and Markiplier, anybody with upwards of 100,000 subscribers or a million subscribers who start to make videos for a huge demographic and put out multiple videos a day. Channels that do that, who post lots of videos a day, make lots of content so they can reach lots of people and you know, drum up their reputation, which to me seems like a great thing, but I'm sure to some people it seems like a flood of information. Uh, it means that those people have trouble because their fan base, as diehard as they are, can't watch everything that all of their favorite people produce. There's just too much, and there's not enough hours in the day. I see where this is going. They're trying to make things to where people really think about what they upload and upload only the best to try and shave that off. But here's the real problem with it is that this is YouTube videos. I mean, the truth is if we had the time to sit and think about everything that we made from stem to stern, we wouldn't be putting out enough content to still make this a viable revenue platform. There has to be a give and a take there. You have to be free to put up your videos without worry and at the same time have the ability to make a wide variety of content because you're going to gain a lot of fans and those fans are going to have different tastes and not every video you make is going to be for everyone. It's not like a series on TV where the Walking Dead fans are going to watch every episode of The Walking Dead. When you make a YouTube channel, it's a channel. And you don't watch every show that comes on Cartoon Network. I don't care how devout you are. Just a thought. And now where we sit, people want lots of watch time, i.e. watching long videos, but they also want you to come back to a channel daily. YouTube has pushed some of their promotion to be, if you don't return to a channel that you love every single day, you don't get the promotion that you once did. That's a problem for anybody who doesn't produce daily content. Again, it's down to vlogs, because animators can't put up animations daily. And sure, you might argue that a diehard fan might go back and watch an old animation every day, but I can't think of anybody whose cartoons are that entertaining. I'd watch them every day for an entire year. Uh, beyond that, it means that people who don't upload daily, again, don't have people returning daily. And sometimes people just do wash sessions. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Game Grumps but I wait to the end of their playthroughs sometimes and just watch them from stem to stern like I recently did with Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. It means I didn't watch their content daily, even though I had a fantastic viewing session. And thus, they may have fallen through the cracks a little bit just because of my inaction. This is compounded and made even harder by the fact that it's really hard for a content creator who makes videos to reach out to YouTube as a company and somehow discuss problems that arises with YouTube algorithms. It's like an employee not being able to talk to their boss and just having to kind of wing it until they see the magical thumbs up from their boss's office. And it should be simpler than that. So how do you fix all of this? Well, the easy thing to say is just use all the metrics, all of them, but that would require tons of man hours on YouTube's part to be able to sift through everything, to be able to make sure everything was up to snuff. They obviously don't have those kinds of resources. YouTube is already still not breaking even on a lot of their revenue streams. That creates a problem for them because at the end of the day, they need to promote anything that makes them the money they need to keep this platform sailing. It's basically the equivalent of the crew on board a pirate ship complaining about the conditions on the ship while the captain is running around trying to make sure that the boat still floats. 
So what are you gonna do? So ramble aside, I do think I see an answer. We've got lots of metrics here. We've got watch time, number of views, likes versus dislikes, and of course, you know, all the no normal community standards. To me, that says that each video and each channel as a whole needs a YouTube report card. It may seem a little bit strange to imagine your videos being graded on its successes, but honestly, I think this would be a fantastic way for YouTube to communicate to its creators. Remember when you were in school and your professor gave you an assignment and said it needs to meet the following five criteria? And then when you got your grade back, it had a number grade at the top or a letter grade, and it broke down how well you did on each of the five categories. Maybe length of paper, discussion of topic, critical thinking, sources. Boom, there's four just by itself. Uh, of course, turn in date. <laughs> there's another one. So uh, all these things contributed to your grade. And I think it's as simple as that. They've already got computers calculating all these metrics for the different YouTube videos. How long the video is, how long people actually watched, daily retention, viewing session, uh, and then of course community standards is number five. And I would say each video can be graded at least automatically on those four, if not five, if they just said, oh, this video doesn't have a lot of complaints about community standards, kind of using the like, dislike bar and reports to kind of calculate the last one. If it calculates each of these things individually, how long is the video compared to optimal video watch time? Uh, how long are people watching as compared to the end of the video? Do people continue to click on? And if so, what's the percentage? Um, on and on. Basically to give you a numerical grade for each of your videos. If you see that people are dropping out halfway through your video, Maybe that's a C or even a D to let you know mm, you're not quite reaching your audience as effectively as you're supposed to. And again, this is all easy. It's just done by the numbers, done with simple percentages calculated per your video. All that to say, each video could come with a simple grade. Click on your video, go to its information, see its grades. A, B, B, C, A. And let you know your total grade for that video is a B, for instance. That way you can know what you need to improve on. A's and B's look fine. The C could probably use some tweaking. It lets you know where to shore up your content to kind of make better content for YouTube going forward. Or like in school, if you're happy with a B, then fine, <laughs> screw it, that's good. And then they could show you A videos get promoted X, B videos get promoted so-and-so, C videos get promoted hmm, and of course, uh, F videos don't get promoted at all because they're trash. <laughs> this would be a lot harder to game than any single metric that YouTube uses to promote videos. It would also be a fantastic way for a channel to know how it should grow and how it should proceed on in the future. They could even use the standard grades for these videos to establish a channel grade, establishing if they should promote a channel when its videos first launch versus if they should just let the channel continue to grow organically on its own for a bit. This would allow for a very decent rise and fall in things that seems a lot more fair. And that's because we're grading things on more than just one thing. The old Einstein quote springs to mind that if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll think it's an idiot's entire life. Sure, it may be an internet rumor. He may not have actually said that. Still applies. For example, here's kind of what our metrics look like now. Our numbers aren't impressive, that's fine. What's important is that we have a bunch of graphs, we've got some numbers, but it's all just data. If you don't know how to process it because you're a writer or you're an editor or you're a person who sings and you're not a mathematician, this can be pretty confusing. Now, I thank uh, the people over at Game Theory for making a video that inspired me to think this way because it is their number crunching that helped me kind of put all the pieces together. And in my opinion, it should be pretty easy to calculate that stuff out and convey it in a way that is meaningful to your content creators. I wish it looked more like this. You see? It's got the five metrics, and if you click it, it's got a drop-down menu, and next to it is a simple letter grade. You know, A for good, F for bad. It's simple. We all grew up with it. It's something all of us know. It's pretty much international, too. 
So you see that, you understand how you need to improve your channel, raise the low grades, focus on the ones that are really high. That's where your channel thrives. It also prevents some of the bad videos like we'd seen before from rising to the top. You can't rise to the top with a 10 second video because your metrics would be terrible. You can't rise to the top with a video that fails to deliver or has a problem with its community standards because it's like barbably terrible and therefore it fails to rise. You can't rise to the top with a video that doesn't create a good viewing session. Maybe this should be a problem because people still make great hour long videos and I don't always have time to click on another video at the end. That's why I think it should be rated probably the lowest, weighted the least if you think of it in a grading term. Basically, all of these things put together show us what makes a good YouTube video. And maybe there's more to add. But I think that that would be a fantastic guideline for channels not knowing how to grow their videos. It'd be a lot better than being left in the dark with a bunch of YouTube data. I'd also love to see extra credit come into play with these grades. There's a lot of content that's hard to produce and a lot of content that should be rewarded or incentivized because it creates a better social experience on this social platform. Think about things like collaborations. Some people travel across the country or across the world to do these collaborations. In my opinion, that's deserving of extra credit. What about things like animations that take months of time to produce? Things like Rubber Ninja or Hot Diggity Demon who can't produce daily content but their artistry is not to be denied. I think they deserve a little bit of extra credit. What about celebrity endorsements? Recently, Extra Credit, as the channel, not as the concept, uh, interviewed Suda51, who is a fantastic game creator, or uh, Jay Wits, who interviewed Shigeru Miyamoto. Those sorts of things bring prominence to YouTube, and they put YouTube on a pedestal that even mainstream media can't do. I can't remember the last time I saw Suda51 or Shigeru Miyamoto on mainstream television in America, but, here, but they're on YouTube. <laughs> so with that being said, I think they deserve a little bit of extra credit for going the extra mile. I thank YouTube for existing. They've given a lot of people who didn't have a voice, a voice. A place to speak, a place for creativity and imagination to flourish in a world where everything was being butchered down into the CSIs and NCISs of society. However, it's time for this to stop being a dark magic where you have to feel your way through the dark and find success and start being a science where people can know what they need to do to succeed and thrive together as an industry. That's how we're gonna start seeing YouTube growth. It's how YouTube will start seeing better content that sells more ads. It's how content creators can learn what YouTube wants and better provide it. So YouTube, grade us. It's probably the only time I'm ever going to ask for that. But by God, it's a lot better than what we've got going now. Pen made by dear with our Royce.